Okay. <laughs> okay, so a romance writer and the poet has been given 15 minutes of time in a room full of adults and young adults. And I'm a little scared because uh, there's a sudden throwback to you know childhood where uh, we've had family get-togethers. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of you in this room has been through this. You've had family get-togethers and some relative or the other will come up and say, dance just one song or just sing one song. So this is probably that feeling right now. But uh, fortunately for you, I'm not going to be putting you through that kind of torture. Uh, I'm here today to talk about something which is very, very special to me, poetry and romance. Uh, but before I start talking to you about poetry, I have to sort of have a, I have a confession that I need to make. And uh, I believe that I am not a great poet. I believe I'm still learning how to write uh, well, how to write well, I would say, and sort of make sure that my words are aligned to causes and principles that I believe in. You see, the poetry community in India, in Pune, in different parts of the uh, in different parts of the country, we're very small. You know, we're a very small unit, a very small collective of artists and poets and dreamers and escape artists, so, so to speak. So, you know, I don't know if you all have been following uh, social media in the last one week or so. A lot of things have come to light which has sort of endangered our species as a poetry collective. You know, when we are such people, we are, we are people from different backgrounds coming together, it becomes that much more important and imperative to stand together. But uh, when, when during such a crisis uh, that talks about uh, sexual harassment and child abuse, and when something like this is right in the midst of a poetry collective, um, as organizers, as poets, we are sort of responsible in a particular way. And we are required to take stock of ourselves, of our poets, of our poetry, of the audience members that come. So it's just, uh, it's a very trying time for the poetry community right now because of everything that's been going on, organizers and other poets facing a lot of allegations and accusations. I don't know if you all have been following this, but this is just hot off the press at this point. But what exactly is poetry? Or why do we need poetry in our lives? How is poetry, or how do we make poetry a part of our lives? How do we read poetry? Why do we read poetry? Poetry is a powerhouse. Okay, it powers you, it empowers you, it helps you to take away all your anxious thoughts and feelings and words and convert them into a pinata of sorts. All right, which you save in the form of verses, copious notes, confessions of love, hate, messages that inspire hope and love and endurance and happiness. At the same time, poetry is offering you a glimpse into the minds of a writer. It is a cornucopia that has been beaten down into a rhythm which finds its own beat in the heartbeats of people who read and write poetry over and over and over again. In June 2016, my family suffered a terrible tragedy, the aftermath of which we are still dealing with today in some of our actions and some of the ways we conduct ourselves in public. We're still dealing with a lot of those issues that we have. And it was during this particular time that I went back to my roots as far as poetry and even writing romance is concerned. I went back to Shakespeare, I went back to Byron, Edgar Allan Poe, and Sexton. I read all of these people over and over again. I read John Keats, I read Shelley, Wordsworth, and I read Jane Austen, and I read, ended up reading Wuthering Heights I don't know how many times. Closer back, closer to India, I started again with Gulzar Saab, Sahil Duryanvi, Isma Chaktai, Sadat Hassan Manto, these are some of the people I just kept reading over and over again because I felt that at the time of crisis, these are the people who have sort of helped me overcome whatever it is that I was feeling during that entire phase of my life. And as a family, for me to be able to help my family, for all of us to, to collectively cope with whatever it is that we are going through. So in, in a sense, poetry, in a sense, words sort of saved me on that day, on those many days. It was during that time that I started writing poetry a lot more. I started writing poetry and I, I started performing poetry 
a lot more in those days. And I also ended up finishing, finally finishing the manuscript for my second book, which was out last July, last June. So what I'm trying to say is when you're in a particular crisis, you know, or also it doesn't mean that you need to have a particular crisis in your life to start writing. It doesn't mean that. Don't take that from me, please. I'm just saying that that was my driving force. It helped me, propelled me in a particular direction, probably because I was surrounded by people who were all, all of us were going through the same thing. And that sort of helped me, we, we sort of dealt with it together and poetry was one, one such channel for me to deal with. But, I, today when I you know, sort of sit down to write poetry, the first thought in my head is, I haven't written in a while, so I think I should start now. So this is the thought, this is the thought I have the moment I sit down to write, the moment I sit down to put pen to paper. There are many days and frequently nights when I am just staring at the laptop screen or doodling on the backs of my diaries and notebooks because the words just don't come. And at such, and at such times, I don't know what to do. I stare into space. I will myself to write something in the hope that something inspirational, something beautiful will just magically flow out of my fingers as I batter away at my keyboard. And when this happens, maybe, just maybe, I will be able to silence the ghosts who are now front row seats. They've got front row seats to my talk today. Not to mention, I'm not saying that they're ghosts sitting here, but they probably are. These are the ghosts that have followed me for a long time, and they're always with me. And the only way to silence them, to settle them, is by writing something inspirational, meaningful, motivational, which I feel I have done justice to. You know, there are times, again, when none of this works. The ghosts are loud, and they're banging on the door. They just don't go away. So I take a step back, and I leave everything in its now regular state of disarray, and I just wander around my house, catching snippets of conversations probably floating around from the living room where my parents are huddled around a iPad and they're talking to my sister who's studying psychology in Melbourne. I think it's important that I speak to you about my sister. She's seven years my junior, but I think she mastered psychology way before she reached semester end exams and textbooks. I can't take credit for teaching her anything, but I believe she's learned a lot through me. I believe I've been a stellar example for her in terms of what not to do or what not to be. And maybe even now, every now and then. But my mistakes aren't her mistakes. She doesn't have the same goals that I have. There, there isn't an encore of the same mistakes that I have made in her life. That doesn't mean that she hasn't made hers. She hasn't made her own mistakes. That doesn't mean that she doesn't walk around with the past heavy enough probably at times to sort of make her shoulders droop over slightly. It doesn't mean that. Nobody goes through life like this. Right now, sitting in this very room, each and every one of you has baggage. Some of you have come to terms with it, while some are probably adjusting, you know, sort of shuffling about in their seats uncomfortably, probably because you know these stories are very similar. This is how you and I are alike. We all have similar stories. We all have similar learnings. The only thing that separates us is the time we take to sort of write ourselves into or out of a particular narrative. And that is what separates you and me, even the learnings, for instance. Writing romance, however, in the form of poetry or prose, is not easy. Contrary to popular opinion, romance is not an easy genre to write. It's not always easy to give women, or to give readers for that matter, it's actually very, it's very sexist of me to say that only women read uh, romance. Uh, my father has read all three of my romance novels, I think, so there, okay? So it's, uh, it's very difficult, like I said, for a romance writer to give you reality in fantasy and fantasy in reality because more often than not, most of her readers or most of his readers are people who know for a fact that Hogwarts doesn't exist. So into this bunch, you are trying to give a certain kind of make-believe reality because these are the people who dream about riding off into the sunset. These are the people who dream about romantic walks on the beach by, in the moonlight. These are the people who dream about candlelight dinners. My poetry, on the other hand, is not as romantic, let's say, as my novels. 
The women in my poetry are loud, obnoxious, to the point of I think sometimes I've been called rude on stage. They're feral and they're unapologetically their own people. They don't conform to any laws or rules or norms of society because that is how we want women to be. We don't want them confined or changed to particular belief systems or changed or changed to their existence because of where, because of well, I wouldn't say the privilege, but because of the fact that they are women. So my poetry, my poetry, the, my, my women are loud. Okay, they are heartbreakingly, heart-stoppingly honest and sincere. Sadat Hasan Manto once said that I, I always feel that I'm breaking everything and then at the same time I always feel that I'm bringing everything back together. This was his belief. He always felt that in his, in his attempt to make things better, he shatters everything and then the next moment he's trying to patch up whatever he shattered. This is every writer, this is every poet in flesh and blood and on, scripts, and on scraps of paper that are lined with inks in different colors other than the ones that are running in your veins. On some afternoons when I sort of stare out of the window in my office, you know, half listening to the hustle and bustle that is just continuously thriving in this city, running through the city's veins, I think about the previous night, the night before where I somehow latched onto some of the words written in torn pages of old books that have somehow given me more light than the night lamp sitting on my bedside. I go back to those forgotten memory lanes, which probably should have been forgotten, or let's say should have been erased, or at, at the very least buried by years of counseling and censure at the hands of my friends and my family who did it only because they mean well, of course, but what they didn't realize is that I didn't choose this. This isn't the path I voluntarily wanted to take. I have a pathological condition. I'm going to tell you guys that I have a pathological condition of looking for happiness in places that nobody would even dream of going to. I still don't know where this condition of mine is going to take me. I still don't know how many places and how many lessons and how many more ghosts I'm going to add to my audience. But I know this for a fact. But the place that I am looking for is capable of humility and compassion and love and joy and happiness. And all of these can coexist unconditionally. So if I ever find such a place, will you all accompany me? We can all just go together. And for company, I promise I'll carry all my books on poetry.